So where does all of this leave us with Augustine? Well, I want to say I don't talk about this to make you hate Augustine. A lot of people find this to be Augustine at his least attractive. Now, some of that is probably because we are oftentimes, as Western people, really, really Pelagian. We like to believe we can do a lot of things on our own. We like to be, we can believe we can be good on our own. And, and maybe that's true. I think Augustine would come back and ask what possible evidence we could have of that. But nevertheless, part of what's going on here is that Augustine challenges some of our most deeply held beliefs about ourselves. But it's also, I think, true that Augustine here has what other theologians would consider theological problems. The Eastern Church never accepts Augustine's understanding of either original guilt or predestination. They don't think original guilt makes sense, and they don't think predestination is required by any kind of logic. So, there are other ways of seeing this. However, Augustine remains really important. In the Western Christian tradition, so again, that part of the tradition that takes its cues from the, West, the Latin-speaking theologians, particularly Augustine, original guilt, meaning both a corrupted nature and an inherited guilt, becomes part of the working theological framework. Meaning, after Augustine in the West, even if you're going to disagree with ideas like original guilt, you're going to have to take them on. Augustine sets the conversation. It's just a different conversation in the East. They don't have to talk about original guilt. But in the West, they do. It also means that predestination becomes part of the theological framework. This notion that grace might mean that God literally comes and says, whoop, you're going to look at me, is something that theologians are now going to have to grapple with. Because, again, Augustine sets the terms for the conversation. As we'll see, theologians do different things with this. They back away from it in various ways. We'll see theologians that fully embrace it. We'll see theologians that say absolutely not. But again, Augustine, both because he saw predestination in the Bible and because of his understanding of original guilt and his understanding of grace, thinks it's just the logical thing to say. In the Eastern Christian tradition, again, the tradition that takes its cues from the Greek-speaking theologians, Original sin, in the sense of inherited guilt, does not become part of the theological framework. Certainly, the East thinks we bear the consequences of sin. We live in a world marred by sin, but we don't bear the guilt of sin until we actually sin. And there's more room for freedom in the sense of being able to choose because God has given us the capacity to choose. The Greek theologians aren't going to say that we can just do things on their own. They're not Pelagians. They're not Nike theologians. But they see grace as operating in a different way, as, as, as God providing us the ability to choose the good, but not requiring us to do so. Again, parenthetically, I should say that another thing that separates the East from the West is that there is always in the East more room for a tradition called universalism, meaning the belief that ultimately God saves everyone. Or to put it another way, the belief that there is no eternal hell. So major Eastern theologians would say that there is a hell, that after you die, God does somehow purge you of all that had turned away from God. But that ultimately, whatever that means, God redeems everyone. That wasn't necessarily what everybody in the East thought, but there's more room for it. In the Augustinian tradition, even though some people will end up there, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, it's a lot harder to get there because, well, we start off damned. So here might be a helpful way of thinking about the difference between Pelagius, Augustine, and I'm going to have Athanasius stand in here for the Eastern tradition. This is an image of a racetrack, thinking now about how sin and grace operate. For Pelagius, God builds the track and makes the signage. Jesus runs the track first. And then we run the track, and we can run it on our own. We've got the track, we've got signs, we've got Jesus. Good enough, says Pelagius. 
And I should note here that for Pelagius, that's grace. God didn't have to tell us what God wanted, but God did. God gave us an example. What more could we want? Well, according to Augustine, we need a lot more. For Augustine, God builds the track and makes the signage. Jesus runs the track first. We can only run it because God becomes our heart and lungs. We just can't do this of our own. We have to really have God do it for us. So in this understanding of grace, grace really takes over our capabilities and changes them from without. For Athanasius in the East, God builds the track and makes the signage. Jesus runs it first. Then theoretically, maybe we could run on our own. I mean, maybe as Athanasius said in, um, on the incarnation, we could have um, looked at the prophets and seen what they were saying and responded, but we just don't. So grace becomes the battery pack empowering us. It enables us to do more than we could have done on our own, but we're still doing it with our own heart and lung. God doesn't replace what is in us. God further empowers it or animates it. And then finally, let's think about our chart in Augustine. God, Jesus, the human problem and right relationship. Thinking here now both about the confessions and about the later Augustine. Give you a sec, you might want to pause it here and fill out your chart. All right, what might it look like? Well, God, we have God as creator, the source of all good, the source of peace, the source of love. Again, nothing here that, say, Athanasius would not have said, but Augustine just says very, very clearly. Jesus, we didn't talk a lot about Jesus with, in Augustine. Um, Jesus, as you saw in the Confessions, is the mediator. Uh, Jesus is what helps Augustine get away from Neoplatonism to Christianity, but certainly the one who brings salvation. He has a very um, traditional Christology. Human problem. Again, this is where Augustine is different. So our human problem is that there is evil um, that is not made, but that is our actual turning from God. We have the problem of guilt. We're born guilty. We can't choose the good. We are, for Augustine, deeply, deeply stuck. Now, I want to take just a moment here and again reiterate something. There are certainly theologians who critique Augustine on both his human problem and the right and his understanding of salvation or grace, particularly on this idea of an inherited guilt. However, there are certainly theologians who would critique Augustine, but would still say there's something deeply right about what Augustine saw. That one of the things that we get trapped by is our sense that humans are really basically good and it all works out. And, all like, and then we just can't just understand the evil around us. Augustine, whatever else he may or may not have done, gave a, a pretty robust understanding of why things are so often rotten. And even if you don't agree with his anthropology, he does push us to ask that question. If we are so good, then why are we so bad? For Augustine, it's pretty clear why. So then what's right relationship? Well, it comes through grace, and that's a grace that God decides upon. It's not a grace that we earn. It's a grace that if we're given, we turn. We turn to God. And then God fills us with love. God begins to make us more and more like God's self. And that is our section on Augustine. Again, an incredibly important theologian for the Western Church, one whose thinking set the terms of the conversation for much of the theology that will happen over the next thousand or even 1,500 years. Agree with him or disagree with him, and heavens knows people do both. He put a lot of ideas out there that we're still contending with.